Good morning and welcome to Mount Olivet United Methodist Church. We're glad you've joined us this morning. Excited to have you here in worship with us. Um, just a couple of announcements. If you want to pull out your announcement page and bulletin and look along with me, a uh, couple meetings that are happening this week um, are highlighted in bold on the uh, on that calendar. Uh, Nanny Midget Circle will be on Monday at 10 o'clock a.m. meeting here at the church. Uh, so make sure you have that on your calendar. Uh, Mount Olivet softball game will be at 8 15 in the evening um, so go out and support the team or if you're a part of the team uh, make sure you have that date remind your fellow teammates about it and Tuesday evening at 6.30 p.m. will be the Administrative Council meeting. Um, so if you're part of the Admin Council, make sure you have that date and time on your calendar and let Joe know if you're able to attend. Um, our Trunk or Treat is just around the corner. It's only two weeks away. We still have spaces available for trunks, and we still have need for helping for that event. Um, so please stop by the bulletin board and consider signing up for uh, to help on that evening. Uh, and if you're not able to, or if you are, um, we have a box for candy donations in the hallway, and we are in need of candy donations. Um, we got started maybe just a little bit later than usual, and so we're really looking for um, for a lot of donations this year so we can make it a great event. Um, so please consider dropping that by anytime during the week um, or on Sunday. You can drop it by the church office and put it right in that box that's outside um, the church office. And a reminder about our Care and Connections ministry. Uh, consider joining a prayer team and be a part of our prayer ministry. For more information, you can contact Sandra Sawyer, and you can get that contact information from the office, or you can sign up next to the church office for that as well. At this time, I invite you to stand as we join in singing together. The splendor of the King, clothed in majesty, let all the earth rejoice, all the earth rejoice. He wraps himself in light, and darkness tries to hide, and trembles at his voice trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands. Time is in his hands, beginning and the end, beginning and the end. The Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God! Sing with me how great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God. Name above all names, worthy of all praise, my heart will sing how great. God to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art, then sings my soul, my Savior God to thee, how great 
great thou art, how great thou art. O Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout the universe displayed. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee, how great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When through the woods and forest glades I wander and hear the birds sing sweetly in the trees. When I look down, from lofty mountain grandeur and near the brook and feel the gentle breeze then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art how great thou art then sings my soul my savior god to thee how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God his Son not sparing sent him to die, I scarce can take it in. That on the cross, my burden gladly bearing, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. When Christ shall come with shout of acclamation and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart. Then I shall bow in humble adoration and there proclaim my God, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to thee. How great thou art, how great thou art. Amen. You may be seated. At this time, we invite all of our children forward for our children's moment with Pastor Mark. Good morning. Come on down, friends. And if you want to, let's all sit on the front pew here. Or right in front of the pew, that's fine too. <laughs> You're going to get in it. Very good. Very good. Well, good morning to everybody. It's good to see you. Um, our message today is for you guys, really, it's for everybody in here and everybody watching at home. And so when I ask some questions, I'm going to want you guys to answer. And if it's okay with you, I'm going to have everybody in here answer as well. Is that okay? Okay. So look what I got in the mail this week. This is a book from Amazon that has over 90 pages of toys in it. And I've been going through it all week trying to find stuff for Miss Heidi to get me for Christmas. And I've got a few things, got a few things picked out. 
But what I started thinking about is that when I was about your age and I'd get a new toy to play with, it made me really happy. And then about four to six weeks later, that new toy wasn't so new anymore. And so I wanted another toy. And I'd get that new toy and I'd play with it and it'd make me happy, but only for about four to six weeks and I want another toy. And then another and then another. And so this morning what I want us to think about is let's pretend that this cup is our heart, right? And we want to have full hearts, don't we? We want hearts full of joy and happiness and peace and love. And so if I only allow the joy that comes with toys to fill my heart, I wonder if that's really and truly going to fill us up. So let's pretend that this is that new toy, right? And the joy from that new toy is poured into my heart. Is my heart full? Friends, is our heart full? Thank you. So we get a second toy. We put that second toy in. Is our heart full? What about a third toy? Is our heart full now? No. Well, what if we go out and buy a fourth toy? Mom and Dad gets us a fourth toy. Is our, is our heart full now? Well, what if we did a fifth one? What do you think? We full? What if we did a sixth one? What about if we did a seventh one? What about if we did an eighth one? Our hearts are never going to get full if our hope, our joy, our happiness is found in things, right? Or in stuff, okay? As you start to get older, you're still going to have toys, but they get a little bit more expensive. And you're still not going to find joy and peace and happiness in just those toys. But there is one thing, one person, that promises to fill our hearts with more than enough. And that is the love that only Jesus can provide. So what we're asked to do is to open our hearts up to Jesus through prayer, through listening to Bible stories, through coming to church, through coming to Sunday school. And look what happens when that love of Jesus starts to pour into our hearts. What happens? We get full and then what? It overflows. Friends, that overflow is joy. And that overflow is love. And that overflow is peace. And that overflow is happiness. And this is the only way that we're going to find it. Jesus promises to be not just enough, but more than enough for us to provide us with what we need. But you know what else? God also tells us that you are enough. Just as you are. Even if you make bad decisions or get in trouble or have to sit in time out. That love of God is never going to stop flowing and pouring into you, okay? So not only is God's love more than enough for us, you are enough for God. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Dear God, we give thanks to you for the love that you pour into us each and every day. Help us to remember that your love is where we find true happiness and joy. That your love is always more than enough. And that we are always enough just as we are for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you can go sit back with mom and dad or go to children's church, whoever might have children's church this morning. Right. Please stand as we sing together. I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay here with me.
I am the vine, you are the branches. Remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. Stay here with me. Because apart from me, you can do nothing. Remain in me. Remain in me. Remain in me. Because apart from me, can do nothing remain in me you may be seated Friends, as we come to our time of prayer for and with one another, just a couple of things to point out and remind us all of. In every pew are these prayer request cards. If there is a person that you wish our congregation to be in fervent prayer for, I encourage you to fill one of these cards out and then drop them in our offering boxes. There's two on either side of the sanctuary on your way out from worship this morning. If it's something that's a little more sensitive, something you'd rather remain just between you and I, then I encourage you just to hand this card to me on your way out from worship uh, here in just a bit. Uh, our prayer this morning uh, is going to be a responsive prayer. You'll hear me say, Lord, in your mercy. And if you feel so led, then I invite you to respond by saying, hear our prayer. So again, I'll say, Lord, in your mercy. And you'll respond by saying, hear Toward the end of our prayer is a space of silence where if there is a name you want to lift aloud, if there is a name you want to take to the Lord silently, that space is there available for you. Uh, once we get there. But let us all now go to the Lord in prayer together. Lord, thank you for the wealth and pleasures that we have. Help us not get too attached to them. Thank you for Jesus' hard words and loving example. Help us stay forever attached to him. Lord, in your mercy. Make your church rich in faith, generosity, humility, compassion, and witness. Impoverish it with regard to pride, heresy, ingratitude, and fearfulness. Fill it with your spirit. Conform it always to Christ, your righteous, suffering servant, and our great high priest. Lord, in your mercy. Increase the faith, hope, and joy of your persecuted church. Let the radiance of its faithful witness illuminate the hearts of its foes with your divine mercy. Lord, in your mercy. Protect our congregation from being tempted to cling to treasures instead of sharing them. To your glory and for the benefit of our neighbors. Help us to prefer nothing whatsoever to Christ. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for young adults in our congregation and community. Let them not be preoccupied with possessions or prestige, but seek to please you each day in self-forgetful service and love. Lord, in your mercy. We remember before you the poor of the earth, that their suffering might be eased. We pray for the wealthy and powerful, that they may use their gifts wisely and generously. Lead the rulers of the nations in the pathway of your commandments. Teach everyone to find true contentment in seeking and doing your will. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you for all who stand between us and the threatening dangers of this world. Keep them faithful, true, and bold. Help them to heal rifts caused by violence and suspicion. Use their gifts to protect justice and freedom. Strengthen them when they falter, support their loved ones, and bring them home safely and soon. Lord, in your mercy. 
Grant that all who suffer find hope and refreshment in Jesus' mercy. We pray this day for those that we bring before you now in the silence of this space, either aloud with our lips or silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. Thank you, dear Father, for receiving all who have died in the covenant of their baptism. Keep us always in that covenant. Help us to encourage one another and bear each other's burdens. Help us to guide our neighbor into Jesus' presence. Together with all of your redeemed people at every time and place, let us forever rejoice in your goodness and see you face to face. Lord, in your mercy. Incline your ear to our prayers, dear Lord, and answer them according to your most gracious and holy will. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, as we pray together the words you teach all of us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Friends, our scripture lesson and the, and the sermon text this morning comes from the Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes. We're going to be in the fifth chapter this morning, taking a look at verses... 10 through 20. So again, we are Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verses 10 through 20. It says this. The lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. This also is vanity. When goods increase, those who eat them increase. But what gain has their owner but to see them with his eyes. Sweet is the sleep of laborers, whether they eat little or much, but the surfeit of the rich will not let them sleep. There is a grievous ill that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owners to their hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. Though they are parents of children, they have nothing in their hands. As they came from their mother's womb, so they shall go again, naked as they came. They shall take nothing from their toil which they may carry away with their hands. This also is a grievous ill. Just as they came, so shall they go. And what gain do they have from toiling for the wind? Besides, all their days they eat in darkness, in much vexation and sickness and resentment. This is what I have seen to be good. It is fitting to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun the few days of the life God gives us, for this is our lot. Likewise, all to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them and to accept their lot and find enjoyment in their toil, this is the gift of God. For they will scarcely brood over the days of their lives because God keeps them occupied with the joy of their hearts. This is the word of God for you and I, the children of God, Thanks be to God. I think I've told some of you, um, but I went to Carolina to be a dentist. See, my dentist growing up was the cool guy. He wore shorts and flip-flops in the office. He had great tickets to all the Carolina football and basketball games. He always had a pair of sunglasses sitting on top of his head. I wanted to be like him. And so when the course catalog came out the summer before my freshman year, I looked up all the prerequisites that were necessary to try to get into dental school. And 
as you would imagine, it was heavy on the sciences, uh, particularly chemistry. And I'm not what you would necessarily call a science guy. One of the required classes then was called Foundations of Chemistry, and I went back online this week to look it up. And it's still there, but now they call it Chem 100. And here's what the class description is for Chem 100. It says, this course emphasizes developing contextualized algebra skills for solving chemistry problems, including physical unit conversions, molar mass, and reaction stoichiometry. <laughs> That's one of the basic classes. <laughs> the other descriptions were a little more complex, so I remember thinking to myself, well, <laughs> dentistry is out. Let's see what else happens over the course of the next few semesters. Well, then came sophomore year, and that's the time when you really start to think about where it is or where it is you want to major and what kind of career you may want to lay out for yourself. And by that time, I had taken and enjoyed a number of political science classes, and so that's the path I decided to take. And I enjoy political history, particularly the history behind political campaigns, predominantly presidential campaigns. I like hearing about, reading about what went wrong, what went right, what was a product of bad timing, what was a product of poor choices, things like that. And I thought back to some of those classes I took as I was reading our Ecclesiastes passage this morning. And so that seems kind of odd. We see the word I kept coming back to was contentment. And the question of well, what is it that makes you content and happy? Because we all want to be content, don't we? And this desire is so widespread. I can remember one of the things we learned about in college is that just about every campaign always revolves around the same theme. And most years, that theme is around contentment. In 1856, John Fremont's slogan was, Free soil, free labor, free speech, free men, free Mont. And then four years later, Abraham Lincoln told citizens to vote yourself a farm. In 1900, William McKinley guaranteed a full dinner pail. And then in 1928, Herbert Hoover promised a chicken in every pot and a car in every garage. And then every four years, as the presidential campaign season cranks up from the primaries all the way through the general election, we know what the candidates are going to promise us, don't we? Every four years, we are promised jobs and full bellies and flush bank accounts. Because it's human nature to think that those things is what leads to happiness and contentment. So let me ask you, does it seem like our country is content? Are you content? Because you see, over 240 years of candidates and campaigns and policies and promises have not delivered the happiness and contentment that you and I long for. But the fault doesn't lie as much with presidents and their failed promises as it is with, I think, a fundamental misunderstanding of where contentment lies and how we can get it. And this morning, King Solomon is trying to clear it up for us. If you read through the book of Ecclesiastes, what you see is a little earlier than the chapter we read this morning. Solomon tells us that contentment is never going to be found in pleasure, in wisdom, in toil, or in advancement. And here in chapter 5, he's telling us that contentment is never going to be found in work or wealth. And what I find interesting is that here you have Solomon, a man who gained more pleasure, wisdom, work, and wealth than anyone alive at that time, coming to the realization that none of these bring contentment. This morning he is telling us that trying to find meaning and purpose and contentment in work and in wealth is bound to fail. And I thought what you and I would do this morning is take a look at the passage verse by verse. Because he first tells us in verse 10 that the lover of money will not be satisfied with money, nor the lover of wealth with gain. Y'all know who America's first billionaire was? It was John D. Rockefeller. And one time, John D. Rockefeller was asked, how much is enough? You know what his response was? 
just a little bit more. That attitude is a little more common than we want to admit, isn't it? No matter how big our last raise was, we wish it was a little bit bigger. No matter how new our car is, we wish it was a little bit newer. No matter how big our house is, we wish it was a little bit bigger. And having that kind of thinking, that just a little bit more is going to make me content, is like chasing a mirage, because we're never going to get there. Verse 11, he says, When goods increase, those who eat them increase. And what gain has their owner but to see them with his eyes? This one I had to spend a lot of time with this week to figure out what it means. What it means simply is having more will not solve our problems. The more you have, the more people want a piece of what you have. Think about the college basketball star right after he gets drafted to the NBA. When they were putting in the endless hours of practice, the early morning runs, the late night shooting sessions, all the hard work necessary to achieve greatness, they were alone. But when the big paychecks start coming in, all of a sudden they have a lot more friends than they knew they had, don't they? Lots of folks around wanting to help them spend their money. Or how about the lottery winners that all of a sudden find out just how many long lost cousins they had that they didn't know about? Does this sound like something that would bring contentment? The other problem, which is so obvious that we're often blind to it, is that the more you have, actually the less you can use. Our children's lesson was a prime example of that. As we acquire more and more stuff, not only do our souls remain empty, but now we just simply got more and more stuff lying around that we don't look at or pick up or use. How much stuff do we have in our homes that do little more than just gather dust? Does that make us content? In verse 12 he says, Sweet is the sleep of laborers, whether they eat little or much, but the surfeit, which is a word for excess, the excess of the rich will not let them sleep. One thing we have in common with money, with the folks in Solomon's time, is that we think having more will bring peace. Solomon observed in his own time that the laborer who has only the basic necessities gets a good night's sleep no matter how much or how little he has to eat. But on the other hand, the rich man, the man who has time for leisure and all the best food, he can't sleep because he's eaten too much or he has too much going on in his life and he can't unwind. Having more money does not bring peace. It actually does the opposite. It brings more anxiety. I think the modern-day philosopher Christopher Wallace put it best back in 1997 when he said, Mo money, mo problems. <laughs> Some of y'all got it, and I appreciate that. <laughs> <clears throat> then verses 13 through 16, he says, There is a grievous ill that I have seen under the sun. Riches were kept by their owners to their hurt, and those riches were lost in a bad venture. Though they are parents of children, they have nothing in their hands. As they came from their mother's womb, so shall they go again, naked as they came. They shall take nothing from their toil, which they may carry away with their hands. This is also a grievous ill. Just as they came, so shall they go. And what gain do they have from toiling for the wind? I think maybe the most popular and seemingly virtuous reason we've placed so much value and purpose on work and wealth is because we want to secure the future for ourselves and our family. Solomon kind of pours a little cold water on that, doesn't he? The situation he describes is anything but rare. A person works hard for decades in order to retire comfortably and be able to provide for his family's future, but then calamity strikes. A catastrophic illness, a stock market crash, a failed pension fund, or years in an expensive nursing home. And the nest egg is wiped out. And Solomon closes with a cold, hard truth that money, no matter how much we have, cannot provide security. And so in the end, hoping to find peace and contentment and work and wealth is just as futile as trying to catch and contain the wind. Kind of hard to argue with Solomon here, isn't it? I mean, if we're honest, we know from experience that work and wealth in and of themselves do not lead to contentment. They lead to sleepless nights. 
and anxiety about the future and uncertainty regarding our purpose in life because the very things that may seem so meaningful at the time end up being very meaningless. And it's true. If our goal to make money is for the sake solely of getting rich, wealth is meaningless. If we work hard hoping that hard work will make us feel content, our work is meaningless. If the entire focus of life is providing certainty and security for our children through our wealth, it's all meaningless because we can't guarantee either of those things. Naked you came in from your mother's womb and naked you will depart and everything which you found meaning in your life will turn out to be meaningless. Why? Because we confuse our identities as children of God and instead see our identities in what we do or what we have. But it doesn't have to be that way. Because Solomon goes on, he says, This is what I have seen to be good. It is fitting to eat and drink and find enjoyment in all the toil with which one toils under the sun a few days of the life that God gives us. For this is our lot. Likewise, all to whom God gives wealth and possessions and whom he enables to enjoy them and to accept their lot and find enjoyment in their toil, this is a gift of God. For they will scarcely brood over the days of their lives because God keeps them occupied with the joy of their hearts. Now, wait a minute. Did Solomon just contradict everything he just said earlier? Why is he now talking about finding joy in wealth? and possessions, and work. What has changed? Well, what has changed is that for the first time, God enters the picture. And God changes everything. When God is put into the equation, then work and careers and money and saving for the future are not meaningless. They are seen rightly as gifts from a gracious giver. There are means that God uses to sustain our short lives on this earth as we look forward to spending eternity with Him because in the end, God knows and God wants us to know that heaven is the only place where we will truly, finally, perfectly be content. And God uses the pain and toil and maybe sometimes meaninglessness of this world to remind us, hey, look, you're not made for this world. God's primary objective is not for us to get comfortable in this world, but to live in and with Him. And the only way for that to happen is through faith in Jesus. To live with God through faith in Jesus means to confess that in one sense, everything, our jobs, our careers, our hard work, our savings, our lives, are meaningless Because none of that has met the standard of perfection that God demands. Hoping to find value and meaning in our work and wealth is meaningless because even the best we have to offer is nothing more than filthy rags in God's sight. And so for this life to have and mean anything, we must look away from our work and wealth and instead look to Christ to be more like Him. His work was meaningful because it was perfect. His life had purpose because he lived to please God, and his life was precious because he took it and sacrificed it for each and every one of us on the cross. Even his death had meaning because it paid for every last one of our sins. And then God raised Jesus from the dead to prove beyond all doubt that everything he did has meaning for us now and forever. Paul explains just what Jesus' life, death, and resurrection means for us in Romans when he says, he was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. Jesus' life and his death overflow with meaning because they meant that his life and our work and our stuff and our money is not all that there is. His life fills your life with meaning because heavenly riches and true peace and security and contentment aren't something we have to work for. They're God's gift given to us through Christ. 
And through faith in Jesus, even the most meaningless aspects of life have meaning. Tomorrow morning when your alarm rings and you hit snooze one, two, or three times, I want you to remember what Solomon tried to teach us this morning. That you can find satisfaction in your work because that is the work God has given you. And if God has blessed you with a job you love or wealth and possessions and time to enjoy them, then give thanks for that because that is a truly rare and wonderful blessing. But let's not waste our time griping or grumbling that we don't make enough, that we don't have enough, because God has promised to give you just exactly what it is that you need. Don't let this life become all about working and accumulating stuff because that's just as pointless as chasing after the wind. And don't waste your time thinking about what might have been or dreaming about what could be because the past is history and the future lies with God. Instead, occupy your thoughts with the rich blessings God has given and promised you in Jesus. Enjoy today for today and let God worry about tomorrow. And instead of praying for more, Pray for the rare ability to be content with what God has already given and promised you. And when you live like that, with a light grasp on the things of this life, with both arms wrapped around that heavenly treasure God gives through faith, that's when life truly has meaning. That kind of life is free from worry and anxiety because it knows that work and money are not the goal of this life. Heaven is. That's the secret to true contentment. Money can't buy it. But when you seek first God and his kingdom and his righteousness, he promises, he promises that all these things will be given you as well. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. <clears throat> Friends, just a reminder, we have uh, two offering boxes here in the sanctuary. One is on this side, one is on this side. If you brought with you this morning a tithe, gift, or offering, and have not yet put it into the box, I encourage you to do so after our worship service has concluded. But it is in deep, heartfelt, sincere appreciation of your continued faithful giving and in anticipation of future gifts. I'd like to say a prayer over our tithes, gifts, and offerings at this time. Let us pray. God, of great blessing, but even greater lessons, remind us again who gives life and who receives it. Sometimes we need to have our questioning answered with a lesson. We need to learn that we are not the ones in charge in the universe. The gifts we bring this morning are not a down payment toward future favor, but a token of a debt we will never be able to repay. May we gain wisdom in the giving, and may these gifts be blessed for your glory, not ours. In Christ we pray. Amen. Please stand as we continue to worship together. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? The King of glory, the King above all kings. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross You laid down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, 
I sing for all that you've done for me. Who brings our chaos back into order? Who makes the orphan a son and daughter? The King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance. The King of glory, the King above all kings. Yeah, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love that you would take my place that you would bear my cross you laid down your life that i would be set free oh jesus i sing for all that you've done for me Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy is the King who conquered the grave. Worthy is the Lamb who was slain. Worthy, worthy, worthy. Oh, this is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free. Jesus, I sing for all that you've done for me. All that you've done for me. sin Jesus is calling have you come to the end of yourself do you thirst for a drink from the well Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Leave behind your regrets and is calling bring your sorrows and trade them for joy from the ashes a new life is born Jesus is calling oh come to the altar the Father's arms are open wide Forgiveness was bought with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was bought with 
the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, what a Savior! Isn't He wonderful? Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing hallelujah, Christ is risen. Oh, what a Savior. Christ is risen, bow down before him, for he is Lord of all. Sing alleluia, Christ is risen. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Oh, come to the altar. The Father's arms are open wide. Forgiveness was born with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Bear your cross as you wait for the crown. Tell the world of the treasure you found. Friends, as we go into this week, let's all of us search our hearts. Where is it we are seeking to find happiness? Where is it we are seeking to find contentment? Where do we know where true contentment lies? And are we allowing space in our hearts and minds for it? We go now to love and serve the Lord. Amen.